I don't know about you, but I know for me, and I'm assuming, you have either known or have been uh, someone that I would call a teacher's pet. So uh, at, in high school, my, uh, I, I made a goal of mine to be love, loved by all the teachers. I didn't care what the students thought, but if I could be loved by the teachers, then surely I would get privileges that others wouldn't get. I did crazy things like rat out my whole Spanish class for cheating on a quiz. I did a bunch of other things, and uh, the motivation, although the teachers thought I was a wonderful child, it really was to get favor. It was for me to earn something for the teachers to see me and give me something in return. I would do the same thing in other settings as well. And and perhaps you have been that person, as I have, or you at least know someone who is. Uh, And even though as bad as I was, there was others that were even worse. And I remember in high school, um, many instances where there was uh, a certain young lady in our class that got a 98 on a test. Um, And after getting a 98 on the test, was upset she didn't get 100. So she went to the teacher crying and begging for a retake, and she got it. Uh, So there are people that are always out to look for how they can gain favor from people. How can we put ourselves in a position where we will be honored by someone? And for some of us, maybe that was a teacher. Maybe for others, it was a coach. You were the type of kid who would be playing in, in sports, or maybe even today, that you would go out of your way to go to extra practices and do whatever you can to, uh, to make the coach happy so that the coach will give you more playing time. Or maybe it's been in some other area, maybe in your job. Maybe in your job, you've worked hours and hours of overtime. You've done above and beyond what you need to do, and all the time what you're doing is you're, try- you're looking at your boss and saying, I just want my boss to show me some favor. I want my boss to give me a raise. I want my boss to give me a promotion. And so we get into this mindset of constantly trying to find ways to earn favor with people and constantly finding ways to elevate ourselves even above our peers. Maybe it's in your workplace. Maybe it's in your school. Maybe it's in your team. Whatever it might be, we try to elevate ourselves. And many times, uh, we can unknowingly even just begin to think about how much we deserve, how much we are greater than those around us. And I know that's a, that is a temptation for all of us as humans because pride is something that is always ready to attack. Today, we're going to talk about that idea of looking to find favor in someone that we want to give us something. And we're going to look at that and how that works out in the life of Jesus and his disciples. But before we do that, let's quickly do a little bit of review. If you have been with us, you'll remember some of this. If you haven't, it might be new. But let's let's look at Matthew. The book of Matthew, that's where we've been. We're going to continue to be in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 34. Uh, And what we've seen, the overarching theme, there's been lots of things that we've looked at. So to boil this down is hard. But really, Jesus has brought the heavenly kingdom to earth. Jesus, the rightful king, the Messiah, has brought the heavenly kingdom to earth. It has not completely been, uh, been redeemed the way it will be one day when he returns again, but as he came the first time, he ushered in the kingdom of God, the heavenly kingdom. And so the rest of this book is telling us what does the heavenly kingdom look like, how do we live in the heavenly kingdom. And one recent theme that we've been looking at is that Jesus has been teaching that the heavenly kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. We need to reset our minds and think about what exactly the, 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 the disciples were having trouble understanding uh, the difference between a physical kingdom in this world and the kingdom that Jesus is bringing in. And so we've looked at several things that the kingdom of God is not about. The kingdom of heaven is not based on or about greatness. Uh, it's not about greatness. Remember, this was the part where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he, he ends up telling them that you need to become like a child, become like a humble child. Children are coming to Jesus. He says, no, let the children come because these are the ones that are going to inherit the the kingdom. This humility is the opposite of what the world would say. You need to find greatness. You need to be great and powerful. We've also seen over the last few weeks that the kingdom of heaven is not based on wealth. Remember the story of the rich young ruler as he comes to Jesus and he has everything in the world. He has everything that you could want to be a great follower, to be someone who would be great to be in, on your team, if you will. And Jesus, at the end of the whole conversation, brings out the idea that he is not willing to sacrifice his wealth, which he has really made a God in his life. And unlike the kingdoms of this world that rely on wealth and status, that is not how the kingdom of heaven will be. And thirdly, just last week, And we looked at a lot of little things, but the big thing that I want us to remember today is that the kingdom of heaven is not based on performance. 
It was the parable of the laborers who came, and, and each of them came at a different time of the day, to get, and, and they, did this, they did their work, and they all got paid the same amount. The idea that the, the, the owner was so gracious to give to all of them what they needed, and yet there was frustration, because people have thought that the kingdom of God is based on performance, what I can do, and how I can make myself look better, and how I can do these things that I need to do. So it's not about greatness, it's not about wealth, it's not about our performance. Now at this point, this is scaring us because this is the world we live in that says if you want to have a life, a successful life, you need to pursue greatness, you need to pursue your wealth, and you need to pursue performance. You need to do what is, you need to work hard to earn things. That is what our mindset is. And I don't want to throw all of that away because there are good things that come with some of that, but Jesus has given us a different way. And today, and we're going to continue this theme, the kingdom of heaven is based on the humble acceptance of grace, as we will continue to see today. So the kingdom is not based on greatness, wealth, or performance, but on the humble acceptance of grace that God has given us. Now, today you're going to find a lot of things may be redundant. Over the last several weeks, you may feel like there's a lot of redundancy where we're talking a lot about the same thing. And that thing we're talking about is grace, the grace of God. And can I just say, let's never be tired of hearing about the grace of God. It is the greatest thing that we have been given, that God has looked upon us, and although we deserved nothing, gave us everything. His love and his greatness and his goodness and his grace and mercy has been extended to us even though we have no reason to, re- to, de- to re- deserve it. This is the truth of the gospel. This is the truth of the Bible. And so, yes, we're going to talk about grace again. But don't allow it to become something that we take for granted or something that is, not, that is, something that is just uh, something we talk about but not something we really experience or understand. The grace of God is huge. And without that grace, we have absolutely nothing. No amount of greatness, wealth, or performance will ever give us anything in this world. The only place that we can find any hope is through Jesus and his grace. And so we're going to continue to talk about that today as we come into chapter 20, uh, as we continue chapter 20, verses 17 through 34. And so, we're going to start, and we're going to read the first couple verses. I'm not going to read the whole passage. It kind of breaks itself up into three parts. So the first part we're going to look at is the means of grace. As we've been talking about grace and how God has given us grace, an undeserved gift, uh, people who only deserved bad instead getting good, that is the grace that we're talking about, then Jesus jumps in after he just ends talking about the laborers in the vineyard and the grace that all people receive, and there's no, there's no favoritism, there's no, there's no hierarchy there. Then he jumps right in to what seems like is just kind of something he throws in to add into the conversation. But as we look at this, it seems very clear what Jesus is saying. So first, we're going to look at the means of grace. So how is it that God shows us grace? And the answer is simple. It's the gospel. Verses 17 and 18. And Jesus was going to Jerusalem, and he took the twelve disciples aside, and on, the way he, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. So Jesus says something incredible here. He says something as he's walking with his disciples towards Jerusalem, and he, he tells them three main things. He says, I'm going to, he says, Jesus tells his disciples that he will suffer, that he's going to suffer at the hands of the Jews and the Gentiles, the Romans. He's, going to, he's saying that the, his own people are going to betray him, and his own people are going to send him to execution by the Gentiles, which in this case would be the, Roman, the Romans. And so he tells the disciples, after just talking about how, the grace of God, talking about how nothing is earned, and in just a moment he's going to talk about servanthood, and he's going to talk about humility. And in all of this, right here, he says, listen, this is what's about to happen. Again, this is the opposite of what you would expect of a human kingdom, of an earthly kingdom. An earthly kingdom is ruled by a king that has all the power that, that is the one killing people, not the one that's being killed. Right? This is upside down. It doesn't make sense. But Jesus starts, he says, I'm going to suffer. People are going to come and they're going to betray me and they're going to kill me. And that's the next point. Jesus tells his disciples that he will die. Not only is he going to suffer, but he's also going to die. Specifically, we're told here, and Jesus is adding detail to what he's already said to them earlier in this book, but he says, I'm going to be crucified. He's going to be mocked and flogged, and that's that suffering part, and then he's going to be crucified. 
the very worst way to be killed at that moment, at that time. Physically, yes, and also there's a spiritual dimension there, which the disciples won't even have any understanding of. That Through that death, Jesus is, caught, is, is paying for the sins of all mankind that will come to him. But we see here that Jesus is again saying, listen, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. Wait, wait, how is a king saying this? And so this is going to be really confusing, and we're going to see that the disciples still don't quite get it, but we're going to get there in just a moment. But the last thing Jesus does say, because Jesus doesn't want to just leave them with depression here, he does say that I'm going to rise again on the third day. Jesus says, I'm going to rise again. So Jesus tells them he's going to suffer, he's going to die, and he's going to rise again. This is the gospel. The gospel is very clear throughout scripture, and this is what the gospel message is. It's the good news that in the midst of this world that is broken by sin and destroyed by sin, in the midst of our hearts that are destroyed and, in, and enslaved to sin, that Jesus comes in the midst of that. He lives his life, but then he suffers and he dies for the forgiveness of sins. Then he rises again to prove his power over sin and death once and for all. And that by having faith in Jesus. Okay, So the, that's the gospel message right there, that Jesus died and he rose again. Uh, Paul would tell us that later in the New Testament, and we'll read that later on. But what we see here is that is the gospel, and the the gospel is what the means of grace is. We don't receive grace by doing things or uh, by, uh, by earning it, by paying for it, by anything. Grace is only by what Jesus has done. Jesus coming to suffer, die, and rise again on our behalf so that we could be forgiven of sin, that is the gospel. And what the rest of the Bible says is very clear, that if we, if we believe that gospel, if we have trust in what Jesus has done, and we follow him and his ways, that is where we receive eternal life, the ultimate grace that is given. By believing in this gospel and living by this gospel, this is where we find our salvation. This is where we find the grace of God. And so Jesus right away says, as we're talking about grace, as we're talking about how the kingdom of God works, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to die, I'm going to suffer, but I will rise again. This is the gospel. So that's the means of grace. If we want to get grace from God, it's by looking to Jesus, believing the gospel. And then we see this story, which has always been one that I have always been so confused by, but, it, but then I shouldn't be, because I know the nature of a person, of humans, So we're going to look at this next passage right after Jesus says this, right after Jesus talks about his death, and and then we get to verses 20 through 24. Okay, so let's read these verses. And then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who have been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever you would be great, whoever would be great among you must also be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus has this conversation now with specifically James and John is where it starts, not only James and John, but also their mommy. So James, John, and mommy actually come to Jesus. Now we don't see James and John in this passage, but in the book of Mark we see that they are actually there asking the question as well. So the picture here is like what used to happen when I was a teenager and I wanted to go and like spend the day with my friend or have an overnight like thing and and I would go and we'd talk about it as friends and I'd be like, all right, you go to my mom and I'll go to your mom and then they can't say no, right? So it's like, I don't know. And so then like the power of the mother. So these, these guys who are, keep in mind, late teenage years, most likely. uh, So they're asking their mom or their mom is going with them helicopter parenting at its best, all right, and she's coming with them, and they're all asking, can James and John be on the right and left in your kingdom? In other words, can they occupy? We want them to have the greatest positions in the new kingdom. 
Again, I don't think they're understanding what the kingdom's all about. We've been talking about the kingdom. Jesus has been talking about the kingdom over and over again about humility and servanthood. And, and the first will be last and the last will be first. And these guys don't really get it. Um, but we see here uh, that <clears throat> they come and they really see grace as a means to gain power. So here's one thing I will say. They might partially understand what Jesus has been saying. Notice they don't come to him and say, look at all we've done. Peter already did that, right? Peter, a couple chapters ago, our last chapter said, hey, look what we've done, Jesus. We've given up all to follow you. So what are you going to give us? Right? That's Peter's way of doing it. He's always a lot more direct than the others. So he says that. James and John and their mom don't come and, and say, look what all that we've done. Will you give us these positions of, of power? Will you give us the, these positions of authority? They actually come and they kneel. We read that, uh, that the mother here kneels before Jesus, asks him for something. They're asking Jesus. So they're not doing anything to earn this. So they're really asking for grace, but they have a specific understanding of what they want from Jesus. And what they want is to have this power, this elevated place in the kingdom of God. They are the ultimate teacher's pets. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to earn favor and, and all that they've done. Now, there might be some reasons for this. There are a lot of commentators and a lot of scholars that think that from what they can deduce that actually James and John may have been cousins of Jesus. And if that's the case, and if mom, which many believe is Salome, would be his aunt, like, okay, so they might be saying, hey, we're your family. Surely we're going to be able to sit next to you. Or maybe there was other thoughts in their mind. We don't really know exactly why they thought that they should be the ones to be there, but they're the first to ask, apparently. And so they are, as I would think about that, the teacher's pet that nobody really cares for, which we're going to see in a moment what happens with the other disciples. But I just want to focus in on here that, yes, they're asking for Jesus to do something. They're not looking to earn it, but at the same time, they're asking for the wrong thing. They're asking that... They, God would use his grace to give them power, which is the ap- absolute opposite of what Jesus has been saying. And then Jesus does rebuke their delusion of grandeur. This idea that they are deluded in their mind to think that somehow they need to have positions of greatness. And they are deluded, and he, he, he wants to make that very clear. He tenderly rebukes their delusion of grandeur. He, Jesus points out that they don't quite get what they're asking for. You know, this is, he just got done talking about his death, and then he says, You're gonna, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? The idea of this is, are you able to experience what's about to happen? Are you able to identify with me in the same way about what's about to happen? He just told us what the cup is going to be, that he's going to die. right? And, then, and so he says that to them. They say they're ready. Um, I don't think they understand the answer that they're giving. I still don't think they really get this. The, the whole conversation, Jesus is making it very clear that they're not understanding what the kingdom of God is all about. So he rebukes them and says, you don't know what you're asking. This is not for me to grant. This isn't, this isn't the right thing to be concerned about. When he talks about Jesus, or he says the Father is the one that's going to give the right here, I believe that's basically just saying, let God be God. Just trust in his sovereignty, and you don't need to be asking or begging for something extra, something more that you don't absolutely need. You are missing the point. Jesus is being very clear that their question the mom and the, and the sons, as they come together, are asking the wrong question. They're looking for the wrong thing. They are looking for grace in one sense. They're looking for a free gift. But they're not understanding what the result of grace should be. One of humility and one of the first being last, the last being first, as Jesus has already been talking to us. And then we see the other disciples enter. The other disciples enter when they are filled with envy and pride. So as we look at this verse, we see, yes, the other ten come in, and uh, they're a little upset. When the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. So you got the other ten, they hear what's going on, they heard what, and I can just understand, like I have pictures in my mind back of school, some of the looks I got from students when I did some things like blowing in their cheating ways. All the, like they just, it's, there's anger, there's other, how dare you do this? Now, on the surface, we could say, well, maybe this is good. Maybe they're upset with James and John because they know they're asking for the wrong thing. So maybe the other ten are the ones that are in the right here, and they're like, yeah, you guys shouldn't have asked for that. Shame on you, right? That's, that's not what's going on here, and this is how we know, because Jesus calls them together and says something to them. So Jesus knows their hearts. He knows what's going on. The ten are upset because they are filled with envy and pride. The point is, they're upset. They weren't the ones to ask. 
They're upset that they weren't the ones that got there first. They're upset that they're the ones that are missing out on this great gift of being on the right and left of Jesus. Maybe Peter thought he deserved it because he already said, I've given up all things to follow you. I don't know what it is, but they all were having pride in their heart, and we can gather that from Jesus' response, which is verses 25 through 28, uh, where he goes on and he says, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. So he's saying this is how the kingdoms of the world work. There are people on the top, and everyone else is below. It's top down completely, and there is a, an oppression in a sense. He says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must also be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus talks to the disciples, the twelve here, and he's being very, very clear. He's saying, listen, my kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. It's not like the, the Gentile kingdoms. Talking about Rome, think about that. They had an emperor, and, then, and everyone else had to be brought in line under him. And we're seeing here that they're, they're mad at him, but the effects of grace that we see here, uh, and that's the next point, is what should grace do? Well, grace should lead us to not base our lives on power. The kingdom of heaven is not based on worldly power. That is what we see here. Like, Jesus is being very clear, like, this is, not like the, this is not like the kingdoms of this world. This is totally different. Worldly power, the goal, the goal is totally different than the, the heavenly kingdom. So Jesus says, listen, you know that the Gentiles do this. This is not how you should do it. So what is the other side of it? If we truly have experienced and understand grace, it'll lead us not to pursue power over others, but it'll bring true power that will be seen through humble servanthood. True power that will be seen through humble servanthood. Jesus is talking to them, and he says, this isn't how you should be acting, but instead you should be a servant and a slave to others. Now these are very strong words. He's using both of these, servant and slave. And and in both of these cases, servants give up their rights for a certain reason. Slaves really at this point have no rights. Uh, And therefore, if you think about it, this is not about a slavery is right or good. This is not the point. The point is what he's saying is you are going to put yourself in a place that you are primarily concerned with putting the needs of others, in the case of slaves and servants, would be their masters, in front of their own. A slave and a servant, they don't live for themselves. They live for their master and they live to do what they're asked to do. They're living to serve others. That's what servants and slaves do. This isn't a list of things to do, but an attitude of humility. I want that to be clear here. As he says to them to be a servant and to be a slave, he is not saying that you need to literally put yourself in positions where you are going to uh, be doing slavery work or put yourself under the authority of people by becoming a servant, like physically. It's this idea of this, men- of this attitude of servanthood and being willing to treat the world like you are a slave or a servant and treat others, treat the, your, your brothers, treat uh, Jesus as the master. You all you worry about at that point is not worrying about yourself, but you worry about serving others. That is what Jesus' whole point is. Kingdoms of this world say, I want people to serve me. But Jesus says the new kingdom is different. The leaders of the kingdom will be the ones to serve the people. And the, 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 greatest will, the greatness will come not through lording it over or for having the, right, the spot on the right side or the left side, but true greatness is going to come by having a servant attitude, a humble attitude that is willing to serve and to put others first. That is the point that Jesus is making here. It's clear that Jesus is making it very, very uh, obvious that the kingdom of this, of this world is different than his kingdom. And then Jesus brings out the the period on the uh, on the sentence like this just brings it all to an end it shows everything that jesus is saying he says look you need to do this but why even as the son of man he's talking about himself the son of man pictured in daniel that would rule the world keep in mind when he says that that's what he's talking about the son of man the ruler of the world came not to be served but to serve in other words not to put his own interests first, but to put others first. And how did he do that? Well, we're told, and to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom for many. 
That's what he says he did. Now, this word ransom, we often think about like somebody gets like uh, abducted and somebody wants money to get them back. That's okay. But really, when we're talking about a ransom here, it's about, it's about freeing someone from slavery to sin. To, to ransom someone was to buy them from being a slave to be your own. Now, two things I want to point out there is Jesus says, I, am, I have given my life as a ransom. The payment to remove people from slavery and bring them into the new kingdom is Jesus' death. It hasn't happened yet, but he is showing it to be that it is coming, that he is coming to do this. He's giving his life as a ransom to buy people out of slavery. But there's a point there. Jesus doesn't just buy us out of slavery and leave us on our own. We also then become servants and slaves of Jesus, which is good. So Jesus is saying, not only am I just going to leave you on your own after I ransom you from slavery. This is, I want us to think this through. I heard this this week as I was studying for this. I thought it was great. That Jesus doesn't just save us from something, but he saves us to something. He saves us from sin to himself. That is the beautiful ransom that he provided by giving his life. It's similar to if there was uh, somebody uh, living uh, a homeless life and, and we were to go to them and say, you know what? Um, I know that you are in a bad situation, so I'm going to just uh, give you some money so that you can get out of this, and then I'll never talk to you again. Right? That's not going to do any good for them. Jesus is saying, listen, yes, I am paying the ransom. I'm buying you out of slavery for myself. That's what Jesus is doing. That's his example. He does that for us out of a servant's attitude. We see that also. Uh, I just want to go to another quick passage in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, should be on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 8, 9, talking about grace, this is what we see. This is what we're told in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that, by, that you by his poverty might become rich. That's what Jesus does. He gave up his richness so that we could be rich. He, in the greatest sense ever, that we would have grace from God, that he would make himself poor, that he would give up all that he had to give up so that we could be saved. And we also see that in Philippians chapter 2, but we're going to look at that in later as we get to our conclusion, so we'll save that for later. Jesus is the ultimate servant, and so we should follow his example. So now, so far, we have seen the means of grace is the gospel, an abuse of grace by James, John, and their mom. The effects of grace, what it really should affect is the idea of, servant, of humble servanthood. And then we see an example of grace. Verse 29. After all this teaching, this is what we read, and they went out of Jericho, and a great crowd followed him, and behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, the son of, or Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. I love, when I first got this passage as it was worked out, I read it all together and I was struggling because I was like, okay, I see, I see how the first two things connect. Well, this just seems like a random story thrown in here that two blind guys get to see. That's great. That's awesome. We've seen that before. But as I studied and thought about this this week, I, am, I love that this passage comes right after what we've just talked about because it, it is an object lesson of grace. There is no question and I love some things we're going to see here. And, and I, the story of these two guys that are begging for their sight is exactly the type of person we should be following and emulating. Okay, not the disciples who are asking for power. And we'll get there in a moment. So an example of grace. So we see uh, what happens here is there are blind men begging for mercy from Jesus. They call him the son of David. They know he's the Messiah. They know he's the Messiah. They know who he is. They believe in who he is. They believe in what he can do. And so therefore, because they believe in him, they are begging him for mercy. See, the disciples were asking the wrong question. James, John, and the other ten. Their question was, how can I become great? These two blind men are asking the right question. They're not asking to become great. They're simply asking for mercy. They understand that they, uh, they have earned and are owed nothing. 
And so all they can do is beg Jesus for mercy. Beg him for grace. They're asking the right question when the disciples weren't. Here we could actually say it this way. The blind guys were actually the ones who could truly see. The blind guys were the ones who truly could see what it was to follow Jesus, to beg for mercy and throw yourself at the grace of God. We see this come up in Luke 18 as well. I want to jump over here because I think this is another good example of what God is looking for as we think about the kingdom of God. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Many of you will maybe be familiar with this parable. But in verse 9 of Luke 18, this is what we read. He also told us this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I believe we go to this passage because we're seeing this happen here in Matthew when we even look at the disciples who are followers of Jesus versus the blind men. The blind men understand that begging for mercy is what needs to happen, just as the tax collector in this parable does. So again, we see the truth of the fact that what this kingdom is all about, what Jesus is all about, is mercy and grace. Interestingly, as we just read that, the crowd in this situation, in the book of Matthew, dismissed them. The crowd dismissed the blind men. They don't get it. The crowd is following Jesus. If you were to take this as a picture, and you're looking at this huge crowd following Jesus, two blind men yelling out and begging for mercy... You would think, okay, this crowd obviously is understanding what Jesus is teaching because they're following him, but they're not because these blind men are here asking for mercy and what they're trying to do is say, shut up, basically. Sorry, pardon that expression, but that's basically what they're saying. They're saying, be quiet, stop talking, leave us alone, leave Jesus alone. He's got bigger things to do, better things to do. There's greater, there's greater things for us to worry about than you guys and your, your begging. That's basically what the crowd is saying. I'm adding some thought. I'm kind of putting that into their minds. But we can see, though, that they want to put them away. Uh, that's what we're told. Uh, he, as we read this passage, it's pretty clear. The crowd rebuked them. They're telling them, get away, stop, be quiet. But they kept crying out all the more. Now, I don't care what you guys think. Jesus is there, and I'm going to keep yelling for Jesus because I need Jesus. I don't care what you say. Isn't that a great example as well that we could even think about for ourselves? No matter what others say, they knew they needed the mercy of Jesus. The crowd dismissed them. The people following Jesus are not getting the idea that Jesus is drawn to the downtrodden and the humble. That is the kingdom of heaven. And he's about to show them a clear example because then we see, yes, Jesus showed compassion or pity. Jesus showed compassion to them. This is an object lesson of what grace looks like. God has compassion and mercy on those who humbly ask for it. Jesus looks at these men. And while the crowds are saying, go away and be quiet, Jesus asks them what they want, they tell him, and he does it. Not because they earned it, not because they were good enough, not because they were already following him even. He did it because they begged him and asked him and believed that he could do it. And he does. He shows compassion and pity on them. He shows grace to the blind men. And so as we've looked at today, we see there's some misunderstanding of grace, but there's also a great picture of grace today. That the gospel is the means of grace. That through Jesus' death and resurrection, he gives us the ultimate gift of eternal life. That some people didn't get it. James, John, and his mom, and even the other ten, didn't quite understand what the kingdom is all about, what grace is all about. That grace should lead us, the effects of grace should lead us to to not desire power, but to be humble and to serve one another and have a humble and servant heart. And then finally, we see that God gives us a great example of grace as two men who are simply begging for mercy are given mercy by Jesus because of his compassion, not because they earned it, but because he loved them. I think we can draw a lot of things out of this for ourselves as we see this idea of what grace is all about. So as we then conclude, let me just ask three questions, and there's going to be some Bible verses that we're going to read with each of these questions, and I want us to consider these things. The first question is this. 
Have you humbly received the gift of the gospel of Jesus? We talked about that the means of grace is only through Jesus' death and his resurrection and then your response to that. That is only how we receive grace. We don't receive grace by what we do, how much money we have. We don't receive grace on uh, how much power we have in this world. We only receive grace. We only receive eternal life. We only receive the promise of forgiveness of sins through Jesus, his death, and his resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, we see this. 1 Corinthians 15 is very clear to us what it is that we need to believe. So now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as the first importance that I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve, and he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. This is Paul talking. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But then notice verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and you so believed. Paul reminds the Christians in Corinth, it's all about the gospel. It's all about Jesus' death and resurrection. It's trusting in that. It's believing in that. And that is how God transforms people. He talks about himself here. But how does the transformation happen? Not because of his works. Not because he's a certain type of person. Not because he deserves to be great. But the grace of God is the one who transforms Paul's life. And the grace of God is what's going to transform your life. Whether you are someone who is sitting here and has not received Jesus. You have not understood the gospel and, and said, Jesus, I, want, I believe you and I want to follow you. I want to believe and live the gospel and I want that to be part of my life. Would you please save me? Would you please forgive me? Maybe you haven't done that. Make today the day you do it. But even if you already have known Jesus, you have a relationship with him, don't lose focus on what is so important that Jesus, through the gospel, shows you grace every single day. Trust in his grace. He will transform you from the inside out. So have you humbly received the gift of the gospel of Jesus? The second question for all of us today is this. Are your priorities based on this world or on the grace of Jesus? Are your priorities based on this world or on the grace of Jesus? A couple of verses to consider as we ask this question. 1 John 2, 15 through 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. John, as he writes here, says, don't believe the lies of the world. Don't live only for what you can, for your own pleasure, for what you can see, or live in a pride of life, live in a selfish life. That's not the way the kingdom runs. That's not the way the Christian life is meant to be. You need to run away from the world. Don't love the world. Don't make your life about the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and and about pride because that's not from God. It's from the world. But what does come from God? Let's move over to Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16, and I love this verse as we think about all that we've looked at today. Let us then with confidence... Hey, this has just been talking about how Jesus is our great high priest. He's experienced the life that we're living. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So what is our calling as Christians? It's not to pursue uh, the desires of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life, but instead to humbly come to Jesus to come to the throne of grace where we receive everything we don't deserve, that we may receive what? Mercy and grace to help in the time of need. When we are in a time of need, even as Christians, God doesn't owe us anything, but we yet we sit and we beg for his mercy and grace and we look for his work because he's a loving God, a good God who wants to show us mercy and grace, but we need to trust him for that and not try to do it on our own. Again, here in Hebrews 4, 16, what is the point? The point is that we come to God asking for mercy and grace every single day. That is how we live. 
We don't live in the way the world lives, but we live in a reliance upon Jesus, a reliance upon God, his grace and mercy for us, not on ourselves as the world would say to do. And finally, are you ready and willing to humble yourself to serve others? Are you ready and willing to humble yourself to serve others? This is, again, remember, about an attitude. This is not the sermon where I have the opportunity, although I could, to list all the places in our church that you could serve. There's lots of places you could serve. I'm not concerned about the specifics here. What I'm concerned about is the attitude that we have. Is our attitude one of humble willingness to serve? Philippians 2, 3 through 11, no doubt many of you know this, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, one of the most humbling passages of Scripture. Philippians 2, 3 through 11. This is what Paul says as we think about the teaching of Jesus. I'm sure, I have to assume, I, I have to assume as Paul is writing this, he's remembering what he's heard about Jesus. Maybe this very same story, I'm not sure, but he knew who Jesus was, he knew what Jesus was about, and he says, all right, here we go, let's talk about it. Philippians 2, 3 through 11. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This beautiful passage reminds us of what Jesus did. Jesus stepped down from the throne of heaven, as we're told here, emptied himself. He, he gave up his rights in order to humble himself to the point of dying on the cross. That's what Jesus is saying, even back here in Matthew. I'm going to die on the cross. He humbled himself in the greatest way. And as he humbled himself, then we go back to the beginning of the passage because the point is we look at Jesus, we see what he's done, that he did, did not hold on to his rights, but yet gave them up for our behalf. That is, the, that is humility. That is servanthood. It's saying, I'm going to put myself last. I'm going to put you first. That is an attitude of humble servanthood. That's what Jesus was the example of. But then we go back to the beginning. It says, in that example, then how are we to live? Well, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. That is the Christian life. That is the new kingdom. That is the heavenly kingdom. It's living with one another in a way that puts you first and me second. And that is the goal. We love God so much that we will then see Jesus' example and follow that example and live a life of humble service to God and to others. That is the calling that Jesus is putting on his disciples here, and it's the calling that we have as well. That we would follow the supreme example of Jesus and be a humble servant, because that's where true power is. True power comes from God as we submit to one another, as we humble ourselves before others, as we put others first. Again, let me just finish by saying this. The world does not live this way. The world says, do whatever it takes to put yourself on top. The world we live in says, do whatever it takes to have success and to put yourself on top of others. And that is not the way that God says we should live. Instead, we should be submitting ourselves to be under others. Voluntarily. Just as the disciples needed to understand. And part of that starts with us just coming before God. Realizing we have nothing that we can offer and just begging him for mercy day by day, relying on his grace every morning. That is our calling. But let us not forget the end of Philippians chapter 2, 3 through 11, that even after Jesus did all this, it was all to the point that one day, every knee is going to bow, everyone's going to confess that Jesus is Lord, and God's going to receive glory. Jesus and what he did will bring glory to God, and so, so will our humble servanthood as well. We have one song we're going to sing. It's Jesus Messiah. Love one of the verses in here that talks about exactly what Jesus has done as he humbled himself. But also, this is an opportunity for us to sing what we just talked about. To sing, to ask Jesus for mercy, to call out to our Messiah, 
because we need his grace each and every day. Let us stand and sing together.